Hello everyone, welcome to another video. In this video, we'll be looking at eVPN and VXLAN terminology. Let's start with VXLAN. VXLAN stands for Virtual Extensible LAN. So if you look at the name, you have V for virtual, X for extensible, LAN for LAN, local area network. So from the name, there's a connotation of layer two VLAN extension. But you can do a bit more than layer 2 VLAN extension with VXLAN, and I'll be talking about that later. Now, back to VXLAN. So VXLAN is a tunneling protocol that works over UDP IP transport. VXLAN enables you to build layer 2 and layer 3 VPN networks within your data center. So when you think about VXLAN, and you think about MPLS, there's a lot of similarity there from a service perspective, right? So MPLS allows service providers build layer three and layer two VPN services. VXLAN allows data center operators build layer two and layer three VPN networks. The VXLAN header is about 54 bytes this gets added to the Ethernet frame. And so when you think about provisioning MTUs on the links in your data center, you need a minimum of 15, 54 bytes of MTU configured on the links from one VXLAN speaker to another. If you're gonna support jumbo frames, then you will need 9,214. Now let's talk about a VTEP. So this is another common terminology you hear of when you're working or deploying VXLAN networks. VTEP stands for VXLAN Tunnel Endpoint. Now the VTEP could either be a switch or a host. The VTEP is responsible for encapsulation or the decapsulation of the VXLAN headers. The next terminology we'll look at is the VNI. The VNI stands for Virtual Network Identifier. It's about 24 bytes, 24 bits, I should say. It's a 24 bit value, meaning you can support up to 16 million VNIs. This is usually carried in the VXLAN header. The VNI tells a VTEP which VPN to look for to look up when it tries to forward a decapsulated packet. The VNI is also globally significant, meaning that if you have let's say 10 VTEPs participating in a layer 2 VPN, those VTEPs would need to have the same VNI for it for your layer 2 VPN to work. Next we'll look at bomb traffic and HER or head end replication. BOM is an acronym for broadcast or non unicast and multicast traffic. There are two ways to handle BOM traffic in VXLAN networks. The first is using a flawed list, also known as the head end replication method, and the second is to use the IP multicast. So the IP multicast is not usually com not a very common method. But the head-end replication is the more common approach. It allows you to define a list of VTEPs that you want to send bomb traffic to. This flood list can be statically defined on your VTEP or it can be dynamic, dynamically populated using the eVPN control plane. Now let's talk about eVPN. EVPN provides control plane for building layer 2 and layer 3 VPNs with VXLAN. Now, you don't need to have EVPN to build a VXLAN deployment, but EVPN makes the deployment scale. Um, EVPN also provides a way for VTEPs to signal which VNI that they would like to receive bomb traffic for. So I mentioned this earlier, um, when you're doing head-end replication, you can either statically populate your flood list 
or you could use eVPN to do that signaling using the eVPN route type 3. So I'll be talking about eVPN route types in a subsequent slide. So next we'll talk about an underlay network. This is simply an IP network that exists to provide VTEP loopback IP address reachability. This can be built using any routing protocol of choice. You could use OSPF, you could use ISIS, you could use BGP. BGP is a very common approach, um, but you don't have to use BGP. You could use any of the other IGPs as well. Now your overlay network refers to your VXLAN layer 2 and layer 3 VPN networks. Um, these overlay networks or your multi-tenant networks require an underlay network to be built. And they are generally built using BGP as the control plane, especially if you want the network to scale. Now let's take a look at this example topology. Here I'll just talk about a simple VXLAN bridging scenario. Um, I'm going to exit actually from the slide just so I can move my mouse a bit better. So on the left hand side of the screen you see host A and you see VTEP1. These two devices are a member of the same LAN and the LAN is 10.1.1.0. Host A has an IP address of dot one. Host B has an IP address of dot 253. It's not shown in this slide, but it does have an IP address of dot 253 on this LAN. And on the right hand side, you have the same IP subnet, right? So you have the same LAN essentially separated by a layer three network. Um, and then you have an IP address of 10.1.1.2. And the default gateway here is 10.1.1.251. The goal is to bridge these two LANs with VXLAN. So the first thing we need to do to do that is to build our underlay network and then configure the network to carry out VXLAN bridging. But I don't want to talk about the configuration aspect because I'll have several videos to talk about configuration. Let's look at what the packet looks like from segment to segment. So host A would need to be able to resolve the MAC address of host B in order for it to send packets to host B. Well, how does that work traditionally in Ethernet? You send an ARP broadcast message and say, who has the MAC address of 10.1.1.2? I need to build the frame. And then if the person or the, the host is listening to the ARP message, that host will say, yep, I have an IP address of 10.1.1.2 configured. I'm going to send you my MAC address. Well, in this case, host B ordinarily would not see that ARP broadcast, which is why we've set up a layer 2 VPN or VXLAN bridging between VTEP1 and VTEP2. So on this segment, um, host A will have a source MAC address of A. The destination MAC address is still unknown. It sends the ARP message to VTEP1. VTEP1 has VTEP2 loopback in its flood list, so it floods the bomb traffic to VTEP2. VTEP2 sees that bomb traffic over the VXLAN tunnel and says, What's the VNI? Okay, the VNI is say, for example, 50. It looks at that VNI and says, oh, VNI 50 is actually matched to this VLAN between VTEP2 and host B. So I'm gonna forward out that packet on that LAN. Host B then sees the broadcast packet and is able to send an app reply. Host B sends the app reply to VTEP2. VTEP2 sends the app reply over the layer 2 VPN to VTEP1, VTEP1 bridges that traffic to v host A. Host A is then able to build the frame with the source MAC address of host A 
and destination MAC address of host B, which in this case is D. So you have a source MAC of A, destination MAC of D. VTEP1 receives this frame. It bridges that data to VTEP2. But what actually happens is it puts a VXLAN header on top of that Ethernet header. Um, so that forms like your inner Ethernet header. So after adding the VXLAN header, it then needs to add the outer IP header and the outer Ethernet header. So the outer IP header will be the source IP address of VTEP1, it's loopback, and the destination IP address would be 2.2.2.2, which is the loopback address of VTEP2. And then your source and destination MAC would obviously be whatever link um, is used to reach the VTEP2 device. So that's how you build the frame on VTEP1 all the way to VTEP2. VTEP2 is able to remove, once it receives the packet, it's able to remove the outer IP header and the outer Ethernet header. And then it sees the VNI information in the VXLAN header. So it knows which VLAN to actually bridge that data out of. All right, so that's an example of VXLAN bridging and head-end replication. So I'm going to go back and go into full screen. And then we'll talk about EVPN route types. So I alluded to the type 3, EVPN type 3 um, route type, which is used to signal, which is used by VTEP to signal its intent to receive bomb traffic on a specific VNI. Well, you have other types like type 2 and type 5. The type 2 signals the MAC to IP mappings of end host and is useful for layer 2 VPN applications. And then type 5 signals VRF to IP prefix, and this is useful for layer 3 VPN applications. You also have other EVPN route types known as type 1 and type 4, and these are used for EVPN multi-homing. Now let's talk about VRFs. A VRF stands for virtual routing and forwarding table. Generally, when you're talking about VXLAN and EVPN, you have two different um, two different VRFs to be aware of. The first is the IP VRF, which is used to build your layer three overlay networks, your layer three VPN networks, and then you have your MAC VRF, which signifies a broadcast domain and is used to build your layer two overlay networks. Next, we we'll look at route distinguishing and route targets. So this is similar to your route distinguisher and route target definition when you're looking at MPLS. So your route distinguisher stands for, RD I should say, stands for route distinguisher and its purpose is to ensure that every EVPN land route is unique. It is globally significant, which means that each VTEP should have a unique route distinguisher per VRF. Now your route target is used to control which VRF the contents of an EVPN route update should be imported into. The route target is globally significant, which means each VTEP should have unique route target per VRF. So it's very similar to route distinguishers and route targets in the MPLS world, but for the route distinguisher in MPLS world, it's, it's usually locally significant, but in, in um, EVPN world, it's recommended that the route distinguisher be um, be um, globally significant, which means that each VTEP should have a unique route distinguisher. Right, so the next topic we'll look at is IRB. So this is an important topic to understand when you know, designing and implementing VXLAN. So next we're talking about IRB. So IRB stands for Integrated Routing and Bridging. This is similar to the inter-VLAN routing concept in traditional Ethernet switches, where the packets are routed between VLANs on the same Ethernet switch. So you have VLAN 10, VLAN 20 with two SVIs, and then packets are routed from VLAN 10 to VLAN 20. 
right? So that's very straightforward, straightforward um, scenario. So the, you have like a inter VLAN routing between the SVIs, and within each VLAN, you're obviously going to bridge traffic. Well, in the VXLAN world, if you have one VXLAN and another VXLAN, and you need a tenant in one VXLAN to communicate with a tenant in another VXLAN, you use IRB to route packets between the VXLANs, right? So this is a good way to actually think about um, understanding IRB. If you think about the traditional Ethernet switch and intervillain routing, it's a very similar concept with IRB in the VXLAN world. So there are two types. You have the asymmetric IRB, and then we'll also talk about symmetric. But the asymmetric IRB, only the ingress VTEP performs routing. And once routing is performed, the packets are bridged through the VXLAN network over a layer two VNI to the remote VTEP. The remote VTEP decapsulates the packets and bridges the packet to the final destination. So to, for this to work, the ingress VTEP needs to have the same VLAN configuration as the remote VTEP. So if you have VLAN 10 and VLAN 20, and you're trying to be and you're trying to beat traffic from a host in VLAN 10 on the first VTEP to a host in VLAN 20 on the second VTEP, the ingress VTEP needs to have VLAN 20 configured so that routing can happen on the ingress VTEP and bridging can happen from the, say, VLAN 20 over a layer 2 VNI to VLAN 20 in the remote host, right? So you route from VLAN 10 to VLAN 20 locally and then you bridge from VLAN 20 all the way to the final destination. For the symmetric IRB, both the local and remote VTEPs perform the routing operation. The routing is performed over a layer 3 VNI, and there are certain things that you need to be aware of um, for symmetric IRB. I won't go into too much details. Um, I'll actually, actually have a series of videos I'm making on VXLAN and I'll have a lab scenario where we actually look at asymmetric and symmetric IRB and how it actually works in, in, in more detail. But the things to know is both the local and remote VTEP perform routing operation. Routing is performed over a layer 3 VNI and bridging only happens between the VTEP and client in both the ingress and the egress VTEPs. Hope this video was useful for you. If you like it, subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for the next one.